<coughs> this is episode number 28 of the Leggett Podcast with myself, Tom Wickstead. Myself, Andy Grant. And this episode of the podcast is sponsored by Liverpool One. Now, <laughs> I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, Liverpool One are not here to fuck about. The reason why they're not here to fuck about is because they've got three things going on. So first off, they're giving away £20,000 Um so basically £20,000 to a sports team or clubs and you get to win £1,000 of that. So 20 k there's 20 chances to win. So if you've got a sports team, a club, you're struggling to find money for, for kit, equipment, etc., running costs, then, uh, they're, then they're going to help with that. The second strand is they've got a daily program of free family fun on Shavas Park. I got t- told off because it's um, Shavas. I thought we wasn't sure. I wasn't sure either, to be honest. What did you say? Shabas. Shabas. <laughs> Shabas. It's just me and you that kept yeah, getting yeah. it wrong then. So go to www.liverpool-one.com to uh, find out more about that. And they've also got sports events on the park. So uh, Tickle the Ivories Piano Festival and a slide from the first floor of South John Street down to the ground floor. So there's something for everyone, especially during school time, school holidays because usually it's hard for childcare, isn't it, and all that? Yeah, I'm taking Alba down there one day this week, getting on that big slide. I've seen her on Instagram, looks good. So if you go to liverpool-one.com, so basically it's all there, it's all dead simple. You can click across and you can find out, so either uh, meet a champion. So I think I said it last time, but Liverpool's uh, Usain Bolt, Andy Grant, is... Uh, I'm going to be there this Friday, the 16th. <laughs> yeah, doing a couple of talks, and then I'll be there if anyone wants to come and... Speak to me, challenge me for a run. Um, yeah, ask me any questions. Then I'm gonna be there pretty much all day Friday. Sixteenth, uh, yeah. Yeah, Friday the sixteenth. Yeah, so come and say hello to me. Come and get involved. Bring the kids along, and yeah. Shavas part one to two and blue coat five five to six p.m. Yeah, they're the times I'll be about. But again, I'm just gonna be around all day, just mingling. So yeah, yeah. Just so come and say hello and come and support it. So um, for full transparency, right? Liverpool on Liverpool one are giving us a little bit of do re me right, so it it's going to be spent on things for the podcast like maybe cameras, new cameras because these cameras are shit and they're like VHS sort of home porno sort of cameras. Aren't they? So <laughs> <laughs> we need to upgrade them. Um, and uh, so yeah, so the reason why I say that is because because they're very kindly sponsoring us if you go down there and support so go and see Andy at those times and then go and do their activities that they've got going on and obviously the 20k uh, giveaway as well it basically shows to them that um, you know that when we people are taking our advice and going yeah. down supporting it yeah exactly so, yeah. yeah thank you so much Liverpool One you're a star yeah it's been great um, on to our guest for the podcast um, I feel like Tom the podcast kind of set up all that is your type of thing the sponsorship which you've done great with is your side of, side of things. My side, as I said, I know some pretty cool people and I think our guest this week, Dan Nicko, he probably fit into that cool, cool kind of, <laughs> cool person I know. I say that, mate, because thanks to you and I'm going to start off by kissing your ass a bit, you've given me some pretty incredible days and nights from what you start with the boss nights and, and what it's turned into. So uh, just from Madrid alone. Yeah, I've um, a tiny, tiny, tiny part. And I knew you were going to play it down, but either way. <laughs> no, but yeah, no, you, you know, it's a whole operation, whole team. Yeah, stuff, I'm sure it is. Um, sometimes I'm the person sitting in front of this kind of thing, but you know, there is a whole wider team. I'm sure there is. But um, so for the whole team then, yeah. and you, you've uh, given me some pretty memorable nights. So I just wanted to get you on, mate, just to, um, to figure out really from the start how it all come yeah. about, where it is now, where it's going. So thanks for giving up your time. No, of course. Nice one for having us on. I've been listening mate, to the yeah. podcast and do enjoy it. So it is a privilege to be here. Good. So obviously a massive red. Been going the game since whenever was it? I've, I mean... Yeah. Um, well, my dad's always gone the game. So just naturally, as happens in in the city and the culture that we we fit in, um, I started going the game mm. um, for pretty much as long as I, as I can remember. Um, I've got some very clear memories of being being a young child um, going the match um, Annie Road um, cop as well actually um, whilst it was still Terrace really yeah I can remember April 30th really really clear can clearly you? April 30th so how old are you I would have been I was born in 84 so I was 9 right yeah then but that's a really really vivid memory maybe it was because it was sort of 
stamped on me that this was going to be a really, really, really mm. important day. Um, but I've got, yeah, really, really clear memories that day. And Jeremy Goss. Yeah, I never, um, I never um, went, to, my dad started taking me, I never went on the cop. I always remember being in the uh, Annie Road a few times, the main stand. I always remember one of the games was um, when we got beat by Barcelona and they, and they must have had about 60 passes before they scored. They had Owen yeah. Mars playing. I think Michael Owen scored for us, being in the top of the Annie Road and um, everyone just started clapping when yeah. they scored. That was one of my first memories. But my first ever game was against the uh, FC Sion. Okay. And we won six, six or yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. So I will have been eight. Um, so we won 6-3 so yeah what was your first game haven't been Anfield never been to Anfield no fucking hell we need to sort that out this season never been to Anfield no 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 right I'm going to take you a game Tom yeah you said you would I'm going to take you this season yeah I've never been so yeah so Dan you're going to game when did you start kind of getting into the kind of match going culture then with the lads and Um, I mean I think it's always sort of been been around me Um, from Hailwood originally and obviously there's a big contingent in, in Halewood of sort of hardcore match going Reds and sort of grew up around them you know like my dad's always gone the game um, and my dad's had a bit of a field day this week on Twitter posting all pictures from pre-season friendlies which just happens to be like 40 years ago yeah, this yeah. week um, so he's sort of gone the game and been been around that sort of match going culture so for me sort of growing up it was sort of second nature mm. Um I didn't really play much football as a kid um, on a competitive level. Um, I was always more interested in going the game, whereas my brother, he, he played on Saturday and Sunday. That was that was his weekends. But for me, there was something probably around 10, 11, 12 where I thought, I actually really, really, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to go, mm. go the match. Um, so it's always sort of been there for me. And was that just home games or away as well, was it? Um, you know, it... You know, the other way game sort of growing up, but mm. it was when, when I sort of got to your sort of mid teens when you get into 14, 15, 16, and then you start wanting to go the away games because they're a little bit more exciting, they're a little yeah. bit more of an, an, an adventure. And then you start doing the obvious ones the um, Blackburn, Bolton, mm. Man City, you know, my dad, that kind of thing. Um, we'd always gone to Leicester actually, Leicester was one that we'd that, yeah, that, I went to Leicester really stand kid, out. Yeah. So from being like really, really young, got family friends down there. And uh, who, who were big Leicester fans, and and they was looked after us. Um, but yeah, you sort of get to that 14, 15, 16 years of age, and and that becomes much more exciting than than going to Anfield. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd say it was probably it, it would have been sort of year eleven being in school when all of a sudden you start to mm. think well, actually can I go go on my own, and then you go through that sort of rites of passage, you know, getting on bars, travel, that kind of thing, and <laughs> yeah. working out who's who, and 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 working out your little group of mates. It's funny, isn't it? The, the two things I think which are really interesting is number one, how maybe we take it for granted. Yeah, sitting here now, you've not been to Anfield. I think being from Liverpool, you you take for granted about that this kind of match going culture, don't you? And secondly, I think we take for granted sometimes how how good Liverpool are. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. it's you, you know you speak to speak to mates and you know you've people you know they've got all these crazy stories over the years. You speak to lads our age or older, you know the older lads especially. But then you speak to someone, you know, they might be from from Burnley or something, or most places in the UK just haven't got that type of... Yeah. And you do take it for granted, I no, think. No, we are lucky. We're lucky to support, obviously, a team of the magnitude of, of Liverpool FC. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, for me, it wouldn't matter. I think you just fit into that culture, whatever. And mm. if you're supporting a third division team, mm. I think you'd still have fun. You might, I think you might have more fun. Yeah, and, and, yeah so it might yeah. be easier when it comes to tickets, that kind of yeah. thing. But, yeah. but yeah, we are we are lucky that sort of growing up in, in the shadow, you know, of one of of the most successful team in in the country and one of the biggest teams, if not the biggest team mm. in the world. Mm. You know, I I do always think, you know, sometimes you talk about football, you don't, and sometimes you might moan and you think, Fuck, we don't know how good we've got it. You know, just just by luck, being from Liverpool and having and supporting this great club. But yeah, but it was funny you talk about the rite of passage when we had Jamie Webster on. He was talking about that kind of thing. You know, you first get on your first away games. It's very similar. And most lads, yeah, um, who are match goers, go through it, mm. um, and it's something quite quite exciting. You know, I I, I grew up um, around you know the very very well known Reds, so like some Mono, Peter, and all all that. You know, that's when my season ticket 
well, it still is, but mm. when I first got my season ticket, being probably like 13 years of age or something, 14 years of age, I was on Route 28 amongst amongst them, you know, regarded amongst the hardcore the football club. But once you get to that sort of 15, 16 years of age, you know, as cool as they are, as good as they are, you actually want to go on your own with your mm. own mates yeah. and go through your own rites of passage and you want to step on that coach at the rocket mm. on a Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the time, wouldn't have, wouldn't have even stepped on with, with any ale, you know, because it was just it was just good enough getting on the bus. Never mind thinking, oh, I might have a few cans, whatever. It was just just getting on that bus to an away game, be a little group of mates from school, um, and you know, sort of living the dream at that age. I still remember now. I always see this fella at the match, and I don't know whether he'll ever recognise me, but I was like, I think fourteen or something, went went to Birmingham away, and I always remember this fella, and. I see him now and again at the match and I always think like he's my very first memory of yeah, like yeah. you know getting on the bus <laughs> we get on we used to get on the coach from the Merton and Bootle and I always think fucking hell like years later I just always yeah. remember his there's, face there's, there's loads like that yeah. you know, hundreds of fellas that you've known for a decade 15 years two decades mm. you don't know the name no one's like yeah, yeah, yeah just that I mate <laughs> yeah so you go going um, when did the kind of because Again, and tell me if I'm, I'm wrong in this, but you seem to have, well, what it's become now, address the kind of culture and the needs of match going lads of, of what, what what we all want and what we want to do. When was it then you seen that from being a supporter and going the game, you potentially thought, hang on, like this is, the, something needs to be captured here? I've always been really interested in in the off the pitch stuff, the off the pitch culture. Um so, so for me, that's the, the sort of the the the, the, the fandom, the, the the whole thing around being being a supporter, you know, the, the flags, the chance, the close, um, the, the the whole the whole thing that goes on before and after the match. That always interested me as much as the ninety minutes on the pitch growing up. So I can remember when I just said then about being nine years of age on the cop on the last day. I can't remember much about the game, but I remember the flags and the chants and the people standing on the terraces and you know even some of like what you were wearing that kind of thing and that always interested me um growing growing up and part of that culture is it is also football fanzines um and the fancy fanzines are a dying breed now unfortunately and i think there's something really sad in that because fanzines form a really important reference piece for what the fans were thinking or doing at that point in time. And sort of being 13, 14, 15, I wasn't that interested in buying the match day programme. I was interested in buying the fanzine. So the fellas that were standing outside, um, you know, in the wind and the rain or through the wind and rain, as, as one of the old fanzines was called at Anfield, selling these essentially photocopied bits of paper with their ramblings in. So that's what really interested me when I was in my sort of mid teens. It interested me so much that it wasn't just Liverpool FC fanzines I was buying. I bought the Edmonton one when scars are grey. I bought the Man United one, United We Stand, just to see what they were thinking. Mm. Just to get like a slightly different viewpoint, or the viewpoint from the terraces. Um, and I think it probably started writing for one when I was about 18, 19. Just the odd article here or there, not pretending to be a writer, far, far from it. Um, but, but just sort of, I don't know, writing... You know, something that happened in an away game or um, some thoughts around the, the culture or or what the fans are doing or might do, that kind of thing. Um, and I think I got some sort of enjoyment out of it. And this is sort of pre, pre-social media. So this would have been probably around 2002, 2003, 2004. Mm. Um, so this is before Facebook, before Twitter. The internet existed, there were message boards, that kind of thing. Um, Friends but, reunited. Yeah, <laughs> but, but but you know the, the fan scene was still going strong as 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 a channel essentially as a as a piece a piece of media. Um, and it was good, but probably got to a point where I thought I could do this because I often think that in life when I'm standing in a bar or a gig or whatever, I'm or to see something that someone's wearing. I often think. I He's going to be there, Nick. He'll be and doing his own podcast next week. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, and sometimes I go on and do it. Um, but we are probably at some point, um, I don't know, probably post Istanbul in 2000, 2005, 2006, this seed in my head probably started getting 
bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the end, it got to a point it would have been the summer of 2007 where I thought um, Liverpool needs a new fanzine because we were going home and away. Um, we were going to to gigs every week. We were doing stuff in town. And I just felt that there was nothing quite out there that sort of captured the culture of, of what was going on. I remember one moment at the end of the 2006-2007 season, um, we we were we just got to Athens in the European Cup final, the Champions League final. Um, and we were playing Fulham in our final away game of the year. And I never went to Fulham for, for whatever reason, but some lads I know did go to Fulham. And they um, they went via Stamford Bridge. Fulham's grounds fairly close to Stamford Bridge, where the Chelsea team bus was parked up outside. And, you know, in the mother of all coincidences, we just beat Chelsea to get to um, yeah. to, to get to the um to get to Athens to get to the final. And the lads had a banner that said Athens two thousand and seven that they'd ripped down from Anfield the week before. So one of them ends up jumping on the bus, <laughs> opening up this banner, to which one of the coaches and John che- uh, John Terry jump off the bus in front the lads like a really funny story so for lads who are like 18 19 20 years of age as well there's quite quite something and that got posted on an internet forum the next day or the day after and it got sort of ridiculed there were people that were saying like oh you shouldn't have been doing that you know and then in the end of course other posts replace it and that really good story gets lost it's on lost, the internet yeah. forum forever because Within a couple of hours, it's on page two, three, four, and within a day or two, it's it's just it's gone. And I think it was around that moment that I thought there really needs to be something that that records this. Mm. And it doesn't have to record it for a million people, but it's just got to be something that in 20, 30, 40 years time, someone can pick pick up this physical thing and go. It's oh like yeah, folklore that now, that's yeah. quite funny. Mm, mm. So all summer, I think it was just going around my head that I'd quite like to do something. Um, I mean, it's truth be known, I would like somebody else to do something. Mm. Um, but it just seemed at the time nobody was. Um, but what were you doing as in work-wise and stuff then? I mean, d- 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 ironically, my, my background is web. So I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a web developer. You know, I run a web development company now. And back then, you know, I was, I was at uni doing web development and building these big websites and stuff. And, um, and this idea that I had was the antithesis of the internet. It was black and white. It was going to be really amateur. Um, there was going to be no web presence, that kind of thing. It was going to be a real throwback. It was going to be a pound. These were the ideas that were going through my head in the summer of 2007. And at first, I only just started telling this bit of the story, actually. Um, I don't know why, just over the past few months, something's triggered in my head um, to share this. But at first, I wanted it to be Liverpool FC and Everton. I well, wanted like, it to be a Merseyside thing. Really, yeah. Because we were approaching the capital culture year, <clears> and all of a sudden the city was getting proud again. Things were happening. Um, you mentioned Shabazz Park before. Shabazz Park in 2005 was horrible. It was ugly. Mm. Fast forward a few years in the Liverpool One development. Um, you know, made it really beautiful and brought the waterfront close, all that kind of thing. All of a sudden, we're standing, approaching 2008, really, really proud of our city and I'm saying that with my 20, 21 year old hat on 22 year old hat on that I, you know as I was at the time I think for the older people they were yeah. being super super proud but for me at that time I was thinking almost you know the city's ours for the taking here there's so much going on there's so much going on around music there's so much going on around um, the clothes and the fashion and all that you know, there's, there's a lot there's a lot going on and I thought this needs to be recorded and I wanted it to be a Merseyside thing. I really, really wanted that. And that's because you know, I, I don't like Everton now and I didn't like Everton at the time. But I was just passionate about the area of, of Merseyside and the city of Liverpool um, as a whole. So as I was mentioning to a couple of my match-going mates, I approached a couple of my Everton mates. Um, good lads from school. They were going home and away of Everton. Um, pretty much doing the same thing as us, you know, and they're really into the music culture, that kind of thing, going on away days, having great stories. Um, you know, they were they were in Europe at the time as well, so um, they, they were going abroad. And I approached them with it. Um, we were on the way back from a half-man, half-biscuit concert in Manchester. 
and we're in a car and we're somewhere near Ikea and I'm in the back and my two mates are in the front and I sort of lean forward and say, so I've got this idea. And they laughed. Really, yeah. They, they saw it as cop eye behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> that idea, do you know, of, of writing and doing something, it was just a little bit alien, I think, to them. It just didn't sit right. Um, I think, you know, fast forward 10 years, 12 years, whatever, it's got even worse on that front now. But even back then, you know, to them, there was something that wasn't quite good or cool about what I was proposing. So quickly been that idea of getting Evan involved, and I just said to me mates, and they were me mates, the, the original writers, or the writers right away through the fanzine, were just mates of mine. They weren't, it wasn't anyone pretend to be a writer, there was no real aspiring journalist, that kind of thing. 90% of people who wrote on our mag were just my mates. It is, a, it is a big, big and bold idea though. That's, you know, you're a young lad and it's very much beyond your years to look at the city and feel that kind of pride that maybe someone older and more mature would think, you know, yeah, this is, I mean... I don't know, there was something. I don't think I'm looking back through rose tins of glasses here. No, I, I, I remember my dad going in town with me dad and I, I can't remember how old I was, but I distinctly remember him going, fucking hell, this looks good. It used to be a shit all around yeah. here. I remember my dad saying that to me and it was when Liverpool one sprouts up and it looked amazing. So I, I can remember this kind of like my dad feeling proud and he's yeah. not one of these types of people who feels dead. But so but I do think it's a it's bold to be that young age thinking I wanna, you know, do something that's gonna yeah. kind of celebrate this. Yeah. I mean at the time there was no big ambition um to, to do something massive and there was certainly no financial drive to it. I didn't sit down and think, right, you know, get 10,000 subscribers. <laughs> it was nothing at all like that. Mm. Um, I ended up... That's surprising as a 22-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, 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 but I think with this, you know, and maybe we'll touch on some of this shortly, but I think I was very aware at the time that there's a real grassroots culture around this kind of thing and you've got to start things small because if you don't people shoot you down. The Scousers in particular will really mm. shoot you down. Um, but but I think what I had was just honest intentions. And and all I did was, it would have been around September 2007, um, when I was coming in from work, just on a desktop publishing piece of software, just started, you know, get me mates to email me stories and putting them in, that kind of thing. Um, there was going to be no, no fanfare around it. There was going to be no big lights around it. Um, every article that ever went in Boss was anonymous because it was very weird at the time. I didn't want to attract the wrong type of people. I didn't want to attract someone who just felt that they, they, they get a good feeling from seeing the, the name as a byline, mm. that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I thought if people were telling a story um, and the name wasn't going to be attached to it, they'd also be more honest mm. about it, that kind of thing. That's a good point, yeah. And that's all it was. So it was just going to be a journal of, of what happened. So it would have been around that time, um, copying and pasting articles, that kind of thing, into this layout, which was super, super basic. We're talking black and white, hardly any images, that kind of thing. In the truest sense of a fanzine, like some sort of punk fanzine from the 70s. And then um, it went to print. It was full. So we did 32 pages or something, went to print. Um, and when I say went to print, I went to my brother's university got his photocopying card, loaded a few quid <laughs> on it, and literally printed off 100 copies. Photocopied 100 copies, got this big stapler off eBay or something, or whatever at the time, stapled them. And then, um, that was it, they were, they were there. Amazing. Yeah, yeah so... Um, and has, has it come up with the name at this point? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know why the name Boss just... It, it's it, always it was just been there. It was just there from the off, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so with the hundred copies, um, we were playing Arsenal, um, and I just dropped them off in the Hillsborough Justice campaign shop opposite the cop at about one o'clock, and by about five past one they were sold out. Really? Yeah, at a pound a go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only the only um, place we put it on was the forum of ironically another fanzine, and we just put it on the day before. Um, did you have a forum as well or not no no no, 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 no. Just there's that. nothing just just, just the mag um, and put on new fanzine out tomorrow and obviously stuck a lot of interest 
and there must have been people queuing up as I dropped it off, and and, and that was it. So so they went. Th- those hundred copies just went like that, which meant the next week I turned up with a thousand copies. <laughs> this time I used a printer for, and um, and they also went, and then it just sort of. And then did you w- when there. those five hundred when those hundred went? It was hundred, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. When those hundred went the next the next week, did you think sh- like shit? Sort of, we need not you need to up your game, but like there's a little bit more pressure now. Um, maybe a tiny bit, but I think there's pressure anyway because whenever yeah. you raise your head above the parapet and do this kind of thing, there's going to be eyes looking at you. There's going to be cynical people. Mm. So I think I was I was aware of that very very early on. Um, but as I say, you know, we weren't pretending to be anyone. We weren't saying we were the best Liverpool fans because we weren't. We weren't saying we were the funniest or the best writers or anything like that. We were just basically saying, this is something that me and my mates are going to record so that in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time, us or our kids or other people can pick it up out of a box in the loft and go, oh, mm. that's what they were doing back then. Um, it's not very often I look back on them, actually, but when I was on the way out tonight... Oh, um, oh brilliant. I was just I about to ask you. Copy, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's not that many copies around um, at the minute, so I will need these back. So I got these yeah. at the bottom <laughs> of my wardrobe. But, um, but you'll see that th- these are the later editions, actually. And are these coming out weekly or monthly, mm-hmm. are they? Or? No, whenever it was full. Very, very, very sporadically. Um, so over the course of nine years... No, eight. Eight years. Um... We did 16 issues. <laughs> this is quality. I like this, the stuff here. So, dear Boss Mag, reckon you could put an article about stuff to do in the summer when the footy's not on? None of this climbing up mountain shite, though. <laughs> <laughs> and what well, that's the kind of thing that was in there, actually. Like, when during the summer, we did cli- we climbed up Scarfell or Snowden or something. So, yeah. we just wrote a couple of hundred words about it. You know, that, that kind of thing. This is fascinating, this, because, yeah, October 2008... I'd kind of stopped going the game then because I joined the Marines in October 2008. I was just about, I was going to Afghan. This one's October 2008. Yeah. What's the earliest one you've got here? Is um, that, um, that issue before there, February 2008. It's brilliant this though, look at this. It, it said Sapna lad, Scout Solidarity. One of the lads is running the New York Marathon to raise dough. <laughs> Even that, just to raise dough for the um, <laughs> um, Mary Curie, I can never say that, Mary Curie nurses. It's brilliant, that isn't it? Just how, and this is just all your mates, just yeah, yeah pretty much. Into. Yeah, ninety percent were just my mates that we were getting on the bus with. Uh, it was at, at the time, um, I mean, a bit different to now. Um, I get to hardly any away games compared to what I was doing back then. But at the time, like, we had a coach from Hylewood, and I'd say probably 90 percent of of the writers were from from that. And they weren't from that; they were very, very close to us. Brilliant, this range is Liverpool are friendly in August 2008. I was at that up in there. Uh, mm-hmm. Crazy, hey, that isn't it? It says here, boss, upcoming boss gigs here. Yes, so let me see that. What date was that? Oh, yeah, that's not us. We're just using the term boss. So that's ah, not us doing gigs at that point. Ah, right. That, that was years before that, that. That's just us saying. This was yeah, a boss gig to go. Gigs that ah. to go to. So, so, but a lot of these were just like our mates in in bands because really? so it's, we've always been as much about music as we are football. Mm. Um, I always remember someone, um, an older fellow from Hailwood saying to me when I must have been like 13, 14, a good gig is as good as a good match, but probably better. And so he stuck with me. Mm. That. And it's totally true. And at the time, it was just you know, just before, even though I was into music, wasn't quite old enough to be going to gigs. Um, but it's always stuck with me that. So that did form a massive, massive part of of the fan scene, <coughs> and probably what made it different to anything else that was out at the time. Because it just, I mean, you're not going to find a picture of Steven Gerrard or Fernando Torres or Pepe Reina or anyone in there. Mm. Um, you're not going to find any reference to any on the pitch stuff. So you'll be reading a review of that Rangers game, the friendly. I won't mention the score. Yeah, yeah. I've got no idea what the score was. Yeah. But I can't remember. We had a great day out, and we stopped and liked the trick on the way back. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And that's what it's about. That's just brilliant, that though, isn't it? I think, and what I love about it already, and I knew already from knowing you, it would go like this, but we the kind of running theme that we've had through the podcast, which has been 
great for me. I mean, I wanted to get interesting people on, but I wanted to get inspiring people on. And I think Tom will attest to this as well, but a lot of the people we've had on have started things and it's been a passion and the passion's turned into a massive success. And it's because they've started out, which you already mentioned before, there was no massive financial gain. It's like, we're not going to take over the world. I just want to do this because it's fun to do. And They're the best projects. Mm. If you start yeah, anything, yeah, yeah. even if you start a business, I say, and your sole aim is financial gain, it's not going to succeed. No. The best projects are the passionate ones. Yeah. And then if something financial comes out of there, happy days for you. Mm. Yeah. But ultimately, you've got the passion. And, and I think that's really, really important. And I think it's really important that um, people have these sorts of side projects and, and interests. I know it's not for everyone. Mm. Um, it's a bit of a cliche, but I would say like 24 hours in a day. And most people who, who work do nine to five. It's a whole lot of time to be doing something else, yeah. something that you're passionate about. Yeah. There's so many, um, and the internet has given people so many opportunities to do like side hustles and things like that. I mean, look at this, like we were able to put this podcast, like did podcasts even exist in 2007 or nah, like, nah. do you know what I mean? And yeah. like, all right, all right, we've got one sponsorship from Liverpool One, but you know, ultimately all the time and money that goes into it and effort and mm. I just fucking love doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it doesn't feel like work, you know? That's the key, yeah. The, yeah. the speaking that I started doing, I, I got asked to do one um, at my old school done it went really well and then out and then people coming up to me hugging me after it saying oh it was amazing and, and i got such a good feeling from it that selfishly i just thought well, I, I want to do this again and then you know seven six seven eight years later it's at class it's been fairly successful i've had some pretty big gigs and done a few yeah. things so but again i start off thinking selfishly i was thinking this this is making me feel good that i'm making people feel good and i want to keep doing it and it's good. I think the world will be a happier place. I'm getting quite um, quite deep now, but I think like, the world will be a happier place. So if people, I think so many people get bogged down with the with the nine to five, and let it dominate the lives. Mm. And I often say to people, "Oh, mates, so when we're talking about stuff, you know, if you think about the outside, what happens away from the office job that you hate, mm. and get your teeth stuck into something like this, mm. where it actually becomes just a tiny part that it should be in your life." Mm. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, you, mate. You, I was just gonna say you've got the best job in the world, considering what you just mentioned. I was just thinking about it. Then, like, you get to <laughs> do a, do talks all over the country, and like, like you never have a bad day. You know, you can't fuck up a talk, can you? In yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's pressure, I guess. When I'm, I, I want it to, I want it to be good, and I want people to enjoy it. But yeah, I, yeah, a bit like that kind of thing. I just feel it's it's such a you, you kind of focus on the good bit and and the, the hugely positive bit. And again, the financial kind of gain doesn't even come into it. I think, I mean, as as I've made it into more of a business, it's obviously important. But I can fucking hell, I can want to speak in front of five hundred people now, and then after it, you know, maybe if if say ten percent of them come and say thank you or send me a message, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. I've just <laughs> done this, and fifty people are saying to me that it's really affected the day. And I had a guy I done one last weekend, um, Rocket and Ruby. I, I charged people a tenner to come and listen to me speak, and it was amazing. The first one I'd ever put on for the public went really well. A guy was going through chemotherapy and he just said, Andy, if, you know, I'm going on holiday next week. He had my last dose of chemo before I went away and I was feeling a bit fed up, if I'm being honest. But, mate, and he's, he's getting quite emotional saying to me and he's like, I feel ready to take on the world again now and I'm going to go and enjoy my holiday. I'm going to read your book. And I'm, and I'm like, fuck, like, <laughs> again, selfishly, I'm like, this is the best thing in the world. It's just like, so, and I do, but I do think it all comes from that, you know, just starting it small because you enjoy it. Mm, rather yeah. than thinking you know what I'm going to be the biggest motivational speaker in the world and, and speak to millions you know you just go I want to try and just make a few people happy and I enjoy doing it so that, and that's why again I knew I knew your story was like that anyway but to hear you say it it's it, that's that's the inspiring bit I think what people more people need to hear we always go on about it don't we we always go on about it yeah, yeah. yeah. especially in like 9 to 5 jobs and things like that like so many people like I've got 9 to 5 jobs do you know what I mean like I mean luckily I enjoy it but so many people like I, I look forward to this and you, you've got to have other things going on like other little side projects and like i hate this it is cliche side hustles and things like that that you know, like hobbies ultimately turn ho, ho, some hobbies do ultimately turn into like full-time things that you know you can run with and then well i'll, well, I'll jump in two fours because we'll come on to it how it's evolved but do you ever feel like your hobby which you enjoyed so much as it's gone bigger and bigger and bigger to present day where it's felt more this is like a job now or have you still managed to maintain that this is I love doing this um, no I think I think it's always maintained the, the fun part because I think when it stops becoming 
fun is when you take a step back or when you're lying in bed at night and something's going through your head, mm. you realise actually you need to change that or do, yeah. do something, you know, um, d- d- about that. I mean, in, in terms of like where we went with with Boss, you know, before um, before like we got onto the nights and stuff, um, I didn't do this because of Boss, but if you look on the back of some of these issues, the earlier issues, there's a website called Distant Echo. Um, so we're selling a lot of magazines to lads who all dress in a very similar way. Why not sell clothes to them as well? Mm. So I launched a company called Distant Echo. This is whilst I'm still working now, by the way. <laughs> um, where we started selling some of the brands that the lads were. What's and we are? use this as a channel to, to sell those clothes. Um, and again, there was nothing with this where I thought, oh, it's going to make me a millionaire, that kind of thing. I just knew there was an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, um, I saw Transalpino before in one of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so like what, what we started doing is very, very similar to Transalpino. Yeah. And it's a bit of a crossover when Transalpino um, shut down and we started up. And I say we, it was me that started it from the bedroom in my house and going home after, after work, um, probably thinking a tiny bit about the mag. But then thinking about what orders I need to pack as well. <laughs> um, that soon changed. I had to employ a couple of people in town to, to run the site for me because it then turned into a second site called Steeple Palm, which you can see on the back of a later issue. As fashion's changed a tiny bit and the lads got older, um, we Back had the young lads buying off that site and slightly older lads buying off that site. That's incredible, um, that. Yeah, so we were juggling a few things, you know, and again, this wasn't like financially driven where anything was like oh we're going to be millionaires off this or we're going to exploit people far far from it mm. I was like yeah we're doing a mag that you, know, you can read and we'll do a couple of clothing websites where they can read <laughs> tell us where did this entrepreneurial spirit come from have you always had this from a kid in school you know selling bloody football stickers and stuff yeah, you know what I mean us, <laughs> <something like that. laughs> you could go to Costco on a Saturday and um, yeah, no, but, but, like, the yeah it, has, it has been that yeah yeah it's yeah. Yeah, so, like when I was in school I was always doing stuff like that the sweets um, yeah I think I'm in the clear to say it now but the copied CDs or that kind of thing oh yeah so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they, were, they were good ones to do. yeah, yeah I had a mate who used to go to uh, Blockbusters and he'd go and you know hire a game out for Blockbusters for a couple of days yeah. and then you'd do that and then get them so. do it. I, I, I'll be honest I sort of disagree with all that now but um, at the time yeah did it but, but those clothing websites were good at, at the time it was sort of again very very much of off the time we ran them for a good few years. I had, I had like a decent office in town where I had a couple of lads working for me. Lads I'm still mates with now and one in particular. Actually it's a little network of us that though like they were mine. Um like John who's um involved in Boss Night um and did all our first crafts in the front of Boss. He was the photographer you know, for the for the website. Sean who's involved in Boss Night at making the match. Um he he worked on distance on steeple pan that kind of thing so he's able to build up like a good network of, of it's mates great little stories like that stuff, by just yeah. going the game it just ends up being something like this i mean yeah it's fascinating where did it so i'm how, doing this by the way whilst running another company i was gonna so. <laughs> i was gonna that's what i was gonna ask yeah. then so how old so you've got the mags going you started doing a bit of a cloth clothing range yeah where are you in your life now age wise and job wise um, like, oh, that would have been probably you know like I don't know, 2011, 2012, uh, around then. So like, I just now. started um, another company, albeit that sits within a group of companies um, doing web development and still run that to, to this day. Um, for businesses, obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah businesses, yeah. yeah, business to business. So um, we run that from, um, we've got an office at the Albert Dock. And um, so that helped you, did you have a website at all? A rubbish website. The website that's there's a website still there for for. How does that happen? You're in web development because this was done to, <laughs> because this was done to emphasis of the internet. Right. Okay. Can I find it? On yeah, it? yeah. Just go to bossmag.co.uk. This hasn't been updated since 2007. Or like, like the layout of it. Co.uk. Um, the issues would have would have been added. Um, but oh, yeah, man. that was that's how it looked on when it launched in two thousand and seven. So yeah, that is now. proper old school website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone who's listening now just pull over or stop what yeah, you're yeah. doing and, and Google it and But it's not it's not mobile optimized, so if I click buy now, will anything happen? Will you get notifications? So people yeah. can still buy the magazines now there's then? There's a couple of issues. It just knows there's something there because issue sixteen is sold out the last one, but the buy now button still shows. 
um, everything be bothered that sort of that. The, yeah, you, you can you, you can you can buy it. There's a page on there where you can um, see a couple of the um, the issues that are remaining that are in my garage. And you like, oh, this is old school. And I cringe a tiny bit looking at it, given what I do in real life. But but that was the very ethos of. I was going to say, I'd be proud, I wouldn't be cringing, I'd be proud, I wouldn't be cringing. But that was the. Do I say this hasn't been updated since well, yeah, 2007? And it's like iPhone 3G, isn't it? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so yeah, but it, it is. So your your holdings aren't a full. I kind of in the real world, if you like, then a, a kind of job in web development, then in the Albert Doc. Well, running a company, yeah. So we started a company, and so it was your uh, company was it? Let's well, say we sit within a group of companies. Like I run it, but yeah, so like we we sit within a wider mm-hmm. group. But ultimately, you know, it's a it's a proper job. You know, it's it's <laughs> <laughs> running a fucking company, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, how many people? Um, I've got eleven full time now. Really? Yeah, use contractors and stuff as well, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a bit wider. And so when did you start that company then? Um, we did that in, um, well, it came about, I was a freelance developer at the time. So and I'm just come doing, a little bit closer so, to the... So it's 2009, um, I'm just a freelance web developer. I'd, um, I'd graduated and stuff, got a job um, in for an R&D startup, which was really, really interesting. Um, but I did like the commercial side of things. So as good as it was, making prototypes and shipping them out and, and stuff um, and going on a huge learning curve, um, I, I felt like I was missing something. So I went to um, one of the biggest web agencies at the time, not just in the city, but in, um, on a national level. They were doing really high profile um, sites for high street brands, football teams, that kind of thing. I went there, but I went in with, with the sole aim of being out within 12 months going in as, as a much, freelancer no no not when I was full time I went in as a full time regular employee With but the, I wanted to come out as, as a freelancer I wanted to know how to write a proper specification how to project manage what goes in a contract what the payment terms are all the stuff that I didn't learn at the R&D company and all the stuff whilst I was in uni and sixth form that kind of thing when I'm building websites for people I didn't quite get right um, so I left there um, about 2009 um, to become a freelancer essentially and started doing jobs for, for people around the city. Um, fair few from the match actually because uh, I guess the PC of that match going circle mm. is um, everyone has got a real life away from 3pm on Saturday. Yeah. Um, so there are a few people that really backed me at, um, at, in, in the early days. Um, people like Kev, Kev Samson. Um, the author, um, he he was just making, um, he was just bringing together his own film company, um, Red Union Films, which went on to make Away Days, the movie. Um, he got me in to do all the, the the branding, the websites, that kind of thing, um, which was a real help and something he didn't mm. have to do, but I'll be forever grateful. Um, but yeah, one of the contracts I got was for for, the, for um, a company that then offered me a job, which was very nice of them. <laughs> um, they wanted me to come in house and be a full time web developer. Um, I said thanks, but but no thanks. I quite like the business side of things, and I quite like working um, on various um, projects. Um, they got me back in a few weeks later and said, "Well, so we set up a new company where you can run it. We'll invest in you. Um, wow. and you can do all our work." So, so like nearly approaching ten that's, years that's on. Cool now, make, still, that's cool, making a good impression that me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So approaching ten years on now, um, still, how still old, doing that. How old were you? Two thousand five. Um, 21. 21. Yeah, Istanbul, Just yeah. when Facebook fucking started hitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could have been um, Zucks. Yeah, yeah, you strike me as someone along those lines, mate. So, yeah. Fuck yeah, me, you do a bit of work for a company and you say, right, you know what, I want to set up a company. <laughs> fucking you go and do your thing. That's pretty fucking good going, that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, I fucking I think it's great. Did you not yeah. feel no pressure with that then, no? You just t- take it in your, um, your, your strides. Yeah, I I don't feel pressure all too often. No. Um, really? Maybe, maybe, that's at a, at maybe that's a bad thing. Because um, mm. I, I think I think I do operate in my comfort zone. And um, certainly over the past year or two, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to step out of that comfort zone. Because I think if you're in it for too long, you can you can get in in a rut quite easily. Um, but yeah, as an individual. Um, yeah, I don't really feel pressure. What about with staff and things like that? Like, all the headaches that come with staff and, like, payroll at the end of the month and all that? Like, 
That's what's one thing before you answer that to, to lead on what Tom's saying there. We we spoke to a guy called Paul Cheatham, very, very similar to yourself, I think, in the mindset yeah, 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 and very yeah, entrepreneurial. Yeah. And he said that when he started his, his accountancy firm, you know, if if the wage bill at the end of the month was, was 20 grand, he said, you know, and someone wasn't doing the job quite right and the money wasn't coming in, 20 grand, a lot, a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, he could get it together and he could borrow off a mate or go to the bank, whatever. Now the company's growing, he said, and the wage bill's half a million pounds a month. It's like, fuck, people need to start doing the work. And he said, that's where he feels the pressure as the company's grown a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is that aspect, but maybe this is like a bad thing, a bad personality trait of mine. I think despite all this, I am a tiny, tiny bit risk averse. So any gamble I do take has been really, really calculated and well thought out. Um, so, so maybe that's held me back in life a tiny bit and um, then I haven't gone from there to there. Did I like overnight type thing? Everything's been more gradual approach mm. and therefore the risk and the pressure is is reduced a tiny mm-hmm. bit. Maybe on my deathbed I'll look back and think, ah, I made a mistake there. Um, but at the same time it allows you to do, do many different things. It's an things interesting way injury. to look at it, yeah. Whether, whether it's that overnight thing or actually yeah, just constantly building up a bit big, bigger each time. I think it's, it's safer and a lot more manageable to do it the way you've done it rather yeah. than have that big step rather than just yeah at what overnight success yeah well, that's it I always say that it takes 20 years to become an overnight <laughs> success which it well, does really yeah it's well, and everything to learning curves like what we did with Distant Tackle and Steeple Pine didn't turn into massive 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 successes that maybe in our wildest dreams maybe we thought I can look here and I can do but no we didn't lose money and we learned a hell of a lot mm. on the way. And I think I think one thing in life is um, you need to work out as much... You, you need to work out what you want to do and what you don't want to do. You need to rule things out. So I was really liked fashion. And when we were running, particularly Steeple Pine, when we came up with this, we were thrown into the world of fashion. And me and... Me mate, who happen to be the employees, found ourselves in fashion shows in Berlin <laughs> and you? London and stuff, <laughs> talking to, to brands, pitching to them that Steeple Palm was going to be the trendiest um, retailer of clothing for the discerning gents in the UK. <laughs> they were like really going for it. And we're talking to, you know, big brands that we really respect and like that kind of thing. And it was really good to go down that path a little bit. But I didn't get too far down it before I decided, actually, I'm going to retreat a tiny bit back. You know, we did that for a few years and then... And was, was, that, so, was that the kind of risk adverse side of you, the kind of going, um, taking a step back or...? Probably a tiny bit. Um, it's also tough. Mm. Clothing is mm. really, really difficult, the margins that you operate to. And the um, margins small, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the way to look at it in very, very simplistic terms, if you're... If you're buying, a, if you're selling a code recommended retail price for 120 quid, you're getting it for 60 quid. Tiny, tiny bit yeah, less, yeah, but yeah. you know, if you just round up. So, so they're the sort of margins that you're looking at. Problem is, no one pays full price for clothing, myself included. And 10%, 20%, 30% off is no longer good enough. Hmm. People are looking around for 50% off, 60% off, 70% off. I think clothing's. Um, Clothing hasn't caught up to the modern world. They operate seasonally still. No one cares about seasons. I don't care if the coat I'm wearing is from this summer, last summer, or yeah. 10 summers ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. so long as it looks all right. But the way clothing operates and the way the retailers operate, it's seasonal. So retailers now will be receiving their stock for autumn, winter. Mm. They're sitting on a load of summer stock that they need to shift, yeah? They've got invoices to pay for the winter stock that's coming in. What's the only thing they can do? Sell it for what they bought it for. Mm. And that's why everything is mm. 50% off. 60% off if you're lucky. You know, if, you're at a, if you're a big yeah, retailer yeah, yeah. that can negotiate a tiny bit. Um, and the court in, in that cycle. And that's a cycle that we got in. And our customers didn't care if that coat was from autumn, winter 1920. Or it was from autumn, winter 15, 16 type thing. Because it still looked mm. the same. It's like the match going, lads. You don't feel too much away from. Yeah, you know, yeah. Do, 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 do you know what they like and and that's what they want? Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a tough tough thing, but we went into it. We didn't lose money. We learned a lot 
And I think that's... And uh, even if he'd lost money, do you know what I mean? For, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who cares? I, I always think about... Um, pretty Little Thing. They, how they can sell a bikini for two quid. Yeah. On a lot of fast, fast fashion. Like, it's insane. Boo, yeah. who obviously own Pretty Little Thing now, don't they? Yeah. And then there's a few others, um, web ones, that just operate on the web. Pretty Little Thing, I think yeah. there's... Uh, I can't remember, fuck it, like ASOS and all that though. And what are you selling for two quid? Mate, two quid for a well, bikini. They're sort of like big quantities, aren't they? They're yeah, holding yeah. on to stock, bang, 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 bang yeah, it's yeah. out. They'll, 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 oh, they'll, I'm sure I remember, I listened to an interview with the guy, um, he didn't own a pretty little thing, it was another one based in Manchester, n- n- I can't remember his fucking surname, but, and literally, they'll do a design of something, it was just women's clothing, they'll send it over to China, or Vietnam, or wherever they get it made, and it will be on their website within a week and a half. Yeah. From like initial design through to like yeah. it's just that quick. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. It's insane. See me, I was at dead excited thinking, you know, I'm speaking to Danny Nico, he's you know, boss and I know that where now I'm a bit gutted that I'm not speaking to like the next <laughs> um, you know Zuckerberg. Um no don't have to, like I'm thinking like the next um Hugo boss or someone like oh, that, you yeah. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. no, well, we we do do. We've got a clothing business now. But you still you do, you do t-shirts now, I mean, similar to what you're wearing. Like, in fact, we I, I, know, I don't even know. Yeah, I've got, I've got yeah. one actually. Yeah. Yeah. So we, got we, a, we do white t-shirts around the, around the match called UpTheReds.co.uk. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, but, but a lot of that takes the learnings from what we did. Is that what you are up the reds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come now. We don't really show. Yeah. You know. So what did you do? How, so uh, with clothing then, and um, I presume, obviously, because it's not mass produced like like the big boys so are you just buying you, do you buy the t-shirt and then you do the printing yourself or do you get someone else to do the printing or like how does it work yeah i mean we're, we're just buying stock you know but we're taking all the learnings from what we've done here yeah, yeah, yeah. um try to be very data driven with it mm. um, try to automate where we can um you know, don't get our hands dirty with, with the stock, that kind of thing. You know, yeah. we've got other people that, that, that process it for us, that kind of thing. Not sitting there any longer, folding t-shirts. And I mean, I've, got that, I've got that with the book. It's a fucking yeah, nightmare. Yeah, you got to remove anything like that. You know, it just needs to Even be... Even on Twitter. Like if, like having... can be, if, if someone else can do it, yeah, my yeah. philosophy is someone else can do it, get them. Mm. Yeah. Get, get them to do it. So you have like it. a fifth... Like, because there's companies, I know you like third-party companies that you can or to like fulfillment because that is the ball like eh? the, the packing and I remember with my um, fucking triangle bikinis whatever that I used to sell on eBay like it's the packing and walk into the post office yeah, it's, which it's, it's was the killer. ball like yeah it's a killer yeah um, I can't go too much into in, into what we do but oh yeah we've yeah, got, yeah. yeah but yeah, 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 yeah. we've got um no, I, I, we've with got the, people that we, we work with. Yeah, yeah. With the book, when I was I was thinking, um, so fucking hell, the margins you make on a book, you make like a, it's getting sold for sixteen quid and more. No one's making like a quid off off each book, and then that's a joke. And then me and Phil, the ghostwriter, are splitting it. So you know we're not fucking drinking, you know, mojitos on the beach off the sale of this book. Anyway, I was like, well, to to get a bit more money out of it, I'll do all that. So anyway. I had fucking like 2,000 books fucking sitting in my hallway. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I haven't got a hallway anymore. And then I'm just selling them through social media. So you're looking through all your messages yeah, and then you're saying, yeah. send the money here. And then you put send the address. Some emails you say, hasn't arrived. I ordered. I, I ordered it four hours ago. Where think, is it? For the extra fucking 50p you're making by yeah. doing it yourself, you're thinking, what the fuck is the point of yeah. this? I'm a great believer in that. The, you know, spread out mm. the tasks. You know, the, the delegation. It's probably the one thing I didn't know, actually. I kind of sort of left uni and stuff, I was sort of, I'll do it all. Yeah. But then, with some of the people I've worked with since, um, they've they've really installed that in me. Yeah, yeah I, listen, I listen to some business, I mean, even to the extreme of that, so I listen to some business, point that Lawrence Jones, you, Lawrence yeah. Jones, you on his podcast, brilliant, yeah. and he says, outsource everything, and by outsource everything, like, I'm talking, like, just evaluate your time, so if you spend, I don't know, three hours cleaning the house, <laughs> like get a cleaner yeah. <laughs> like God, value your, like value your time like attach yeah. a value to your time oh, yeah. and if it's worth like spending that I don't know how much cleaner is but like I don't know 10 quid an hour like for, for 30 Three hours quid. if you're making yeah 30 yeah. quid if, if you're making 100 worth, quid an hour it's not worth your time no, then of course yeah yeah, then if you, you if you, I was laughing links a few of my mates take the mick out of me because we've got a cleaner but, <laughs> but it's exactly that way of thinking yeah, you yeah, know yeah. It, it, it really is um, or like you, a, you, you can't do everything and more importantly if someone can do something better mm. than you 
So if someone can pack t-shirts better than me, which they can do. I'll yeah, let do them it. do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. 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 It sounds so fucking basic as well, doesn't it? But again, the amount of people who are like, no, I want this control thing where yeah, I need yeah. to do it myself and I need to. Yeah. yeah. Um, dare to say, if you can get a computer to do it, even better. That will upset <laughs> a lot of people. But I'm a great believer that, you know, sometimes if people can apply themselves in a better way than doing something really menial. So if you get a computer to do that menial task, mm. it frees up that person. To do yeah. to achieve the true mm. potential. Yeah. So you think about the workplace. We might have someone in an office. I don't know, putting folding bits of paper into an envelope or something. If you get a machine to do that, I've let the machine to do. It. I've let the machine do it, not to sack the person, mm. but to get the person to do something else. Yeah, yeah. And, and do something more meaningful. And that's yeah. where your hope is that the people have got these passions and these new ideas yeah. to try things. Yeah. Hopefully that'll then burn a new yeah. a new passion and new desire for them. The the worry the. Uh, the thing about the automation, I think I've spoken about this before and Elon Musk has spoken about it a, a number of times about what happens when everything's automated and like truck drivers, you know, they're put out of work and they, they was talking about having a universal uh, income eventually. So basically what they're doing at the moment, right, is they're tax in certain countries, I believe they're taxing robots as if they're employees yeah so yeah. with national insurance here in the uk and you yeah. know etc and so it's a way of taking that tax from taxing robots which is just insane and then plowing it into people who've ultimately lost their jobs yeah yeah like truck drivers when when vehicles are automated things like that but then what does it do to the person who's just sat around in their house it's all day no worth anymore. just mm. getting yeah there's lots of issues isn't there but but I'm with you on automation. Like, yeah. I, like, yeah. I don't want to see that, by the way. I don't want to see truck drivers no, 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 jobs no, no. in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is they're no, the same yeah. things that instead of getting someone to sit in the corner, like do, Frankie do, do, Mail do or monkey something. work, yeah, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Let, let them do something that really yeah. achieves the true potential and what they're actually passionate 100%. about. And it just frees up that time. It's like, like we started off the podcast by saying, you know, try things, see if you're good at that. If you don't like it, yeah, rule yeah. it out. It's not that. Do something else. So, yeah. 100%. So, um, <laughs> I went a little bit off then, didn't I? I enjoyed it though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, boss nights. Yes. Um, so we're probably about five years into doing the mag here. Um, we've got like clothing websites going at this point, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm probably thinking, you know, what can we do next? Um, and one of the lads says, um, I thought we do like a launch party because we were so ingrained in the um in the sort of going out seeing the gigs that, that that kind of thing what if we just did our own gig and we tied it into the launch of the next the next issue of boss um to make it relevant and to hook people in and we'll get some of our mates who are in bands to basically get up and, and play on stage because for me that was a big driver of of the mag it was always a platform and still is so boss is still a platform for people that do things or got something to say um, to use to their their advantage. So, one of my mates, um, Kyle Percy, I've got to mention, so he gets a bit upset every time this story comes up. And he doesn't get mentioned. Um, sort of spearheaded the idea of putting on a gig after the first home game of the season to coincide with a new issue of the mag coming out. So we we throw it, um, we, we put it online, get the word out there that we're doing this. Um, we charge a fiver a ticket at the Stata Gallery in town. And it sold out, like, almost instantly. And all of a sudden, we had, like, 300, 400 of our mates in this room after a match, having a drink, listening to good music, because music is, as I say, about everything. It cuts for everything that we do. Um, and then watching some of our mates in bands get up, and it was a it was a great night. Mm. Um, at the time, it wasn't, it wasn't called Boss Night or anything. It was just the Boss Gig type thing, or people refer to it as the boss man gig um, and it was good and then we got a good feeling from it and I think the build up to that I'd stood in countless gigs and thought I could I could do this and um, a few of us got together after that and said you know, well where can we take her and this is prior to all the real after the match stuff what everyone sees now um, we, we started to do um, just to put on regular gigs so these weren't boss and big massive letters on a poster type gigs these were just bands that we were promoting. Mm. Boss became a promoter with its letters in 
little a little font in the top <laughs> corner. And I think we did call it Boss Night, and I'll be honest, if I would have put more thought into it, I don't think we would have called it that. Mm. You know, it's sometimes cringe at it now, but it was just, we had Boss Mag, so we just put in little letters, Boss Night, present, and then whatever band we were presenting that right. night. But because we're talking to a lot of people on Twitter, and because a lot of people liked the mag, it was a good way of bringing people um, into gigs. Mm. And, and we started doing it for um, for different type, types of bands, and mainly stuff that we were into in, in the city. Um, we then did actually start a dance night off it, um, called Rubik's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which was a great experience. Um, I have to open that mic there. I've got a little poster at the bottom. It's <laughs> for um, Rubik's. Boss Knight presents Rubik's with Sebastian Ledger. Um, he's a fairly big, minimal tech DJ, um, which isn't my scene. Um, but there's four of us involved in, in Boss Knight at this point. Two really into the dance scene and two of us not. But it made a real good team. And obviously you're into business, so like you, know, you think about the hedgehog concept. Like we were bang in the middle of that with that balance of two really into dance music, really passionate, and the other two to keep them grounded, yeah, yeah, put yeah. us bang in the centre of everything. And for a few years we were doing massive nights and getting big, big DJs from all over the world. And we we're flying DJs in from America and stuff. Um <laughs> And this is all a sad warehouses. gig. Yeah. Like you still got your own company, you still yeah. That's fucking uh, where, massive. Where else is in in Liverpool? Yeah, it, where, yeah, in where else is in, in basically the Baltic area? So we did stuff in Camp and Furnace when it first opened. Yeah. Um, that one there was in a place called House. Um, the lads who run that at the time went on to do Bongo's Bingo. Actually, oh, really? they, they're behind that one. Yeah. Um, so so we were just doing stuff, and a lot of it was about getting these big headline DJs in. It's also me, you know, attract people there and fill yeah. the place. But then you look at, at the names, and these are just lads from. From the match underneath, yeah. Chris McGee, Lee Chanik, that kind of thing. These just ordinary lads from the match that we were able to put on on these gigs for. Um, it was good. It was a good experience. Um, what was it like? So, like, you had to arrange security. Well, I mean, the, the, the venues tended to do that kind of thing, oh, right, but yeah, yeah. but you know, we'd essentially book and promote promote a club night. Um, and as I say, it wasn't my scene because I'm into the indie music, tab, bass music. But having me and John who who um who are into the dance scene allowed us to create that balance with our mates who, you know, were more mm. into the party scene because that can quickly get uh, out of hand and very <laughs> yeah. expensive. So so we did that for a few years. Do you reckon I can find any clips on YouTube? Probably, yeah. I just type in um Rubik's with an X. Was there a night where you're thinking like on a Monday morning you're back in your office in the Albert Dock and you're thinking, We were fucking flying in DJ Saturday night, what this is crazy. Um, I mean, no, well, for me, there it is. Yeah, yeah, Sebastian yeah. Just loads there. So, like, Sebastian Ledger, Stacey Pollen, he's from Detroit, a massive, massive house DJ. Cost thousands as well to get him over. Um, <laughs> that's but, what I mean. So, you're not sitting there Monday morning thinking, this is fucking mad, this, you know, I'm doing this job of a Monday to Friday, yet I've just had a fucking big DJ in. And... Well, no, I mean, I, I actually saw this more as work, actually, because <laughs> I wasn't out partying on, on these nights. I tended to take the money home. Um, in a backpack, yeah. or hopefully take take money home because we'll <laughs> fancy a night where we didn't quite. Um, yeah. So what even. happens with the D? So do you have to pay them up front? Do they? If if it's a night that they like, I imagine if they go into Ibiza or, or like Pash or anything like that, I imagine that like they're pretty sure they're going to get the money. But yeah, do you have to prepay them? Yeah, I mean, you sign contracts and then some ask for all up front, some ask for 25%. It's like any business yeah. transaction. Um, I'd say the vast majority would be something like 50% up front. And then 50% on the night, if they're the kind of DJ that wants you know, cash and hand take home, um, or 50% transferred on the Monday. So the remaining 50%. Mm. Um, but you're all tied down to contracts and yeah, stuff. And, yeah. Um, and it, yeah. Because um, it must be a bit like, if you think, Jesus, they're costing me 10 grand or however, however mm. many thousand, you're like, shit, we need to. Oh, it was stressful, mate. Yeah. You know, this is actually some, some nights we did really feel the pressure. Yeah. Um, of this again it was, it was ups and downs because you'd have some real big wins and then you'd have the nights where you're like god we lost money we never ever um, I think we only ever played with the money that, that we had so we had a big success we didn't on the Monday morning go happy days you know let's go to all <laughs> yeah, now it was more the, 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 it's more you know, this is the bank for the next one yeah, yeah, but yeah. again you know, with this it wasn't like truly financially driven on this one um, 
I sort of. Mate, so many. Sure so, I know so many. When I was at Leeds, I went to Leeds. Leeds. Um, I went to university in Leeds, and the amount of nights it spun out from like little student house parties and stuff yeah. like that. It's so cool. That's like, yeah. and then suddenly they're getting bigger and bigger. And then you mentioned like Bongo's Bingo. I, I don't know how that started, but yeah. like things like just suddenly just like it's insane. Yeah, I yeah. love stuff like that. Yeah, so we did it. We did it for a few years. Not say that we we got good people over. Um, a lot of them I picked up actually at Manchester Airport. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, so you picked them up in the car, or some would like request a certain type of car. And um, Sean and Lado, the, the, the more party heads, um, they don't mind me saying that. Um, they then take them out for like a meal, whilst me and John would be probably in the venue hanging up the banners or something, or you know making sure That's everything's brilliant. there. Um, but yeah, yeah, they were good times and, and stuff that I look back at and think, yeah, that was decent. Even though I'm not personally. Yeah, yeah, passionate yeah. about the dance scene they, they, they were always good things so. when did it end then um, we oh, we went to about um, I don't know about 2014 or something um, and then we we, we decided to um, this is actually this ties in well to like the, the boss nights as, as you know it um, sort of gaining a bit of momentum um, we, we sort of the four of us had a meeting and, and two sort of took her on to carry on because they were super passionate about it and and we boss knight sort of stepped away from the brand so to speak and it carried on for a couple more but i think a lot of a lot of brands in this field like any form of, of entertainment have often got a shelf life yeah. and i think the, 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 this sort of reached a point where I just got put on the back burner this might come back one day not through through me but through like to sean and lado and stuff they're still really passionate and proud of what they achieved yeah, yeah. from so you're it right. so yeah, who knows? But yeah, this is something that's that essentially spun out of out of that mag. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's such a nice story, you know, you're all just mates kinda of just and you didn't know when they first started that you should be putting on events like this, flying in yeah, DJs. Yeah. That's the greatest yeah. thing about it. You're just like, <laughs> let's just do this magazine, we got a few of our mates to write for it. Yeah, yeah. Fucking few years so, later. Yeah. So at at the time of this we're we're doing we're doing our gigs as well. Um and then we got in the UEFA Cup. We were terrible at the time. Roy Hodgson. UEFA Cup. Loads of Sunday games. One of the lads comes up with the idea. What if we create something called the Boss Sunday Session? At the time, um, the, the pub in, in town where everyone went after the game where everyone had sort of go to the away games and stuff. Ned Kelly's. That had just shut down. There was nowhere really that people were congregating. Um, I think someone started on the Yankee and stuff again, but... But, but by and large, there was a bit of a, a, a gap. So um, a couple of us went round, started to go around bars in town and pitching this idea. That we know a lot of lads from the game um, through the magazine that we do. Um, they're all mates. They're not really into into trouble and stuff. They're a very self-policing yeah, culture. Yeah. Um, we've got a load of Sunday games coming up. How about if we bring a few hundred people to your bar Every other Sunday, um, we'll provide some live music in the corner. It's got to be free entry. Um, isn't this like the best business deal ever for you? They all said no. <laughs> we went to pub after pub, to bar to bar. They all said no. I think a lot of the time we were talking to the wrong people. Because if you're talking to the ultimate owner of the establishment, mm. they probably have a different view to maybe the general manager yeah, who's yeah, thinking, yeah. I get paid the same. Why do I need to deal with 300 yeah. match going lads coming in? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but in the end, we found a place which was essentially a function a, a, a function room, Oscars, just off Renshaw Street. And then we did the first one that we called the Boss Sunday session. Um, it was after Arsenal, I think it was 2013. Um, it would have been early September 2013. Um, and we basically said, our mates are going to be playing guitar music in the corner. None of this was like football orientated at the time. And we can all go along and have, have a good bevy. And that's what we did. Mm. Um, and they sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger each, each one. It just became like a place for people to come along to, really. It was free. Again, there was no financial motive mm. from us where we were thinking we're going to make... Um, it's time next week we'll be moving. Yeah, there's nothing, <laughs> no, nothing like that as such. It was more where we get a little kickback from from the bar in, in the early days to help pay for the, the artists, to drop the artists a few quid, that kind of thing. But it's more about just getting our, our mates together because nobody else was doing it. I don't think at this time, like I personally thought, oh, did I really want to run like a big venue and anything like that? Mm. It, 
Um, but we, you've gained uh, the trust from everyone from yeah. the years and years of this. Everyone's knows now that they get yeah. that a good magazine, good clothing, good that good night. So but, but that's the, the key. they're just you following you, it. Aren't you they? can't do any of this um, out the blue. So mm. You've got to you've got to build up. It's been built up, build up over years. It. But but as I say with this, I think I probably would have much preferred someone else to do it. And then you go along to it without the stress or the worry yeah. of how many yeah. people are going to turn up, or there'll be any, you know, any windows going to get smashed, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, you do that, you do without all that. You just turn up and have a good drink. Yeah. Um, but you know, it didn't work out that way, and we ended up being um, at the centre of it. And so, so we did that. Um, and each one just sort of got bigger and bigger. Um, not from the off, but by the way, you know, it was never. I can think of one. Um, so we've done we've done a couple of bigger games and, and obviously people tend to stay out longer after mm. after the bigger games. We did one after a really mundane game, like a midday kickoff against West Ham or something. And there must have been about twenty five people there, if that. And that afternoon, John Power got up and played the set. So it was a bit of a moment, I think, for those like twenty five people. It's like being at the Sex Pistols at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester in yeah. nineteen seventy eight or whenever it was. You know, you're watching John Power play yeah. to just you and a couple of mates. Um, but, but how how much did the did what was going on on the field affect that? As in, you mentioned before, Roy Hodgson when when we were doing shit compared to say now under Jurgen, have you noticed that you've always got your kind of hard hardcore there, or have you noticed the kind of Depending on how successful they are, depending on how successful. Yeah, well, I think like, I mean, that one I mentioned there, John Power, that was the last one where that, where there was too few people there. I think every single one since then there's been yeah. too many people there. Um, I don't think it's as linked as as you think the, the success mm. on the pitch. I think success does breed culture around the match, but ultimately at Liverpool, it's a party fan, the hardcore. Mm. I really feel don't let the on the pitch results get them too down mm. some of the best nights we've had over the years have been after we've just been beat by Man United or something mm. that if you're a fly on the wall you'd be looking down thinking yeah, what's going on here Jamie These Webster said that didn't yeah, yeah no, it's exactly that <laughs> yeah. so um, so I, I don't think it's as linked as the general public yeah. would think but you know yourself you, you, you go back the pub after the game. Mm. What's that first pint down? Oh yeah, you forgot about the game. That's a great time on Sunday. Fucking we didn't win the Community yeah. Shield. It was fucking great day. <laughs> great way to kick off the season. It was, I yeah. had a fucking ball. Got in at one in the morning. It was great. But yeah, no, I just wanted you to, from your opinion on it, because yeah, yeah like yeah. you say, I think the general public would imagine that. Oh god, these lads have jumped on something on the back of Jurgen's success. The people who are looking out from the outside, you might think, but obviously no one yeah. knows how it's built up. And like you say, that yeah. culture that's bred from within. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so in that sort of first season of doing it, the, the lads that we attracted were the sort of home and away lads, the lads that you see week in, week out, mainly around our age. Um, I think even at that point, the likes of like my dad, Mono, Peter Newton and stuff have probably already took a step back and forth. Oh, these just all the young kids on the game going. Um, so, it, so it was sort of like that, 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 that sort of um, hardcore. And I think that was the season when we, we did build up to, to May when Jamie played the first time which I know he spoke about mm. um, on the podcast in, in detail and he sort of appeared at the bottom of the bill yeah I mean that that, that one it was on on the YouTube and that I mean did you notice with YouTube when the, the gigs start and obviously because you talking about technology as well we said before when webs when you first started doing this internet wasn't really there fast forward you know doing these gigs there's now iPhones people are now recording it it brings that thing, doesn't mm. it? People want to now get involved. Yeah, I mean, th- that has only been in the past couple of years, you know. Really, uh, yeah. yeah, even like what, what we're sort of talking about there, um, going back um, to sort of 2014, 2015 type stuff, I don't think that really, really happened. You know, the, the people's phones just weren't quite capable of it. The, mm. the apps weren't quite there yeah. to be able to push up a 200 meg video. Um, <laughs> to, 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 to Twitter. But certainly over the past 18 months or so, um, it, it's like any gig in in the real world. The um, just people got their phones out yeah. and can be streaming live. Oh, that's what one Jamie does. He done he's done it in Paris, which I thought was great. In at the gig he's done, which was again amazing, mate. And and Jamie's going, everyone, put your phones away. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it gets it, annoying that sometimes, yeah. isn't it? Once every, when you, when everyone's on the phone, yeah, it, like, and, yeah. and you look into just a load of lights like that. Yeah, yeah, it does get to Jamie. It, it, it he does. does it a few times. And it's great, and he's tell, and then everyone puts the phones away, and he, it's just 
yeah you feel it at one with everyone in the moment yeah then. definitely but i think at this point by the way then the football songs haven't came into it mm. so this wasn't something where we sat down with this ma- magic formula and thought <laughs> if we all start singing songs from the match you know we can get on youtube it was never ever like no, that of course it not. was still just our mates in the pub listening to someone on acoustic guitar in the corner and that happens in every pub up and down mm. the country every pub around the world knows knows that format it was when um it probably was actually related to the success on the pitch it was when some of the songs started to filter in more so maybe around Roy Hodgson it was more oh, we're here to forget about the football yeah but when we nearly won the league under Brendan Rodgers that's when I first remember the musicians reacting to the to the crowd mm. and starting to play the music and Jamie spoke about it a few times when he was playing um, Mrs. Robinson and the crowd started singing, he said, you, Jordan Henderson. So yeah. then he's naturally going to gonna start mm. playing, yeah, yeah, yeah. playing that. All throughout this story as well, mate, what's, what's so magical about it is it's all just very natural. It's just like, it's just a natural progression. It has, it's been really, really From organic, something as similar as that singing Mr. Robinson to Jordan yeah, Henderson, yeah, from his yeah. dad to... Yeah. I've got to say, by the way, like none of this is like you know brainchild of me or anyone else type thing. It is that organic thing of of Liverpool FC fans. So I can't lay claim to it. Boss can't lay claim. I'm sure Jamie won't lay claim to mm. it. This is just like an organic thing as a result of a whole mix of things. That's what I said at the very beginning. Just like mm. a very very tiny oh, part mate. in this, you know. And it makes me feel, wonder- mate, so as, as a mate of yours and as a scouser and as a Liverpool fan, mate, it just a city, and I'm just feeling really proud to to kind of to kind of see it going on do you know what I mean it is very special what, what's been created it's, it's unbelievable yeah so around the time when we like to say the football songs came into it that's when it got a bit wilder mm. and we were on sound uh, well we were in sound and uh, on Duke Street um, at the time which is a very very small bar ran by great great people who really get us because that was the key to when we were going around all these bars at the beginning it's lots of people that didn't get us in the match day culture sound got it but it was just too small and resulted in people like falling out the window, literally falling out. Story, yeah. um, the riot <laughs> police shutting down Duke Street, one of the busiest streets through town. Um, I, I guess, just I guess people, though, if I might be completely wrong, but I'm guessing people are just thinking, are they football hooligans? For people just want to cause trouble after the game? Just yeah, people yeah, don't yeah. Want... there's a, per- a perception issue, mm. of course, which is the opposite. When someone falls through a window, you know, it's because they're partying too hard, not because <laughs> yeah. you know, they're, 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 they're set on yeah. mindless violence but um, we, we soon reached the limit in sound and then we had a challenge then as boss We've got this big thing in our hands all the lads love it where can we go with it the Baltic Triangle area of town it wasn't even on the up at the time you know it was still out on a limb it was mm. far out um, there's a venue there called um, District which was the old picket um, that was ran by Jane Casey and we went to see Jane Jane was one of the original Eric's people back in the day, um, a punk. She was on the front of the Enemy magazine. She later went on to run Cream and then was really heavily involved in Capital Culture 2008, that kind of thing. Um, so she got us. Then when we walked in, she really understood us mm. and made District our home. And I think you know, there is an argument that if it wasn't for Jane, none of this would have happened because we may have hit a brick wall. And just gone and, sod it. Yeah, yeah. and you know, there's no venue that lavers in town, so it's over. But Jane literally opened the doors for us and let us carry on the parties. And that's when it just got out of hand. And I think that Jamie <laughs> spoke about on the earlier episode, you know, with him sort of fast becoming the headline and um, everyone that coming there to see him. Um, yeah, that's when it all really do, got Do you have one of these moments where you're having these pinch yourself moments? Has that already happened at this point or is it when they start to get yeah, a bit more one, party and all? Well, there's, there's a few moments um, during the early district ones when it's still full of all our mates from the match. You're sort of hidden away at the side of the stage and you're thinking, yeah, this is good. This is this is nice. But, but for me, I'm there as, as a punter, as a kid goer as well. I'm not there thinking like, I this is mine or anything or ours no, because, because as I say you know play such a tiny part in mm. in the overall thing do I it, think it's, if all the lads didn't turn up mm. do you know the night's not going to happen Jamie's not just going to stand there and play to me and Sean and John and anyone 
Yeah, um, it's still you know, hilarious it's to think that you've still got, you're still running a full time gig on a Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the funniest bit about it. But yeah, it was good fun. Any of these stand out to you? Like, like ultimately stand out. I mean, the uh, what, what was the one Jamie mentioned when he was on here? It was after Man United. Um, no, the one in the Olympia. Oh, that the was Olympia the Olympia one. Yeah, so I, I can't I remember who referred to this, but I'll refer to it. Um, if you just type in um, John Power, just keep Boss Light and then yeah, yeah. John Power. Um, so this is the Olympia in May. This is uh, unbelievable. The, the top result there, You'll Never yeah. Walk Alone. So You'll Never Walk Alone is a song that the lads don't really sing at the match. Um, it's it, Well, they, they sing it, but it's it's for five minutes before the game and at the end of the match. That's it. You'll never, ever hear this on an away coach. You'll never walk through... Um, a European city where we're playing the next day and hear this ringing through and if you did everyone would be like oh I don't know that's the walls doing that's the old sounds but the hardcore you'll never walk alone is as I say the five minutes before kick off the end of the game and family funerals we had this gig at the Olympia in May and John Powers doing the sound check and he says to me Danny um, I want to play you'll never walk alone tonight and I said oh you know it's entirely up to you, but I'm not sure if the crowd will embrace it because we knew this night, you know, like we sold the tickets basically to, to all the lads from the match. You know, it's not something that normally they'd, they'd embrace. And he did it in, in soundtrack and it did sound amazing. I said, you know, obviously it's up to you, it's your set. And on the night here, because um, I'm playing, like, I'm like playing the playlist, like the, the DJ music. I know John's coming towards the end of a set and I've got to meander back through the crowd to get to um, the sound desk to get the next tunes lined up. And then John starts playing You'll Never Walk Alone and I'm standing there just watching and I'm watching hard lads, the urchins, lads who you know, are on seven-year bands probably never go to a football match ever again <laughs> with tears running down their eyes you know, full of emotion and pride and just hanging off the balcony, singing You'll Never Walk Alone. And, you know, it was a really, really special moment for me. And I think it was a special moment for so, so many people there. The back of the, I, I'm standing next to the sound desk on my own, just sort of <laughs> just having a moment, taking it in. And I think at this point, I, I probably even had, I, I don't think I'd had a drink at this point, so it was fairly early in the night still. And, um, Mate, and I was one of the ones like, crying my yeah, eyes on me. It was just like, it was just something really special about it. And I think if, if you would have said to me a few years ago, like a defining moment of, of Boss would be the song you'll never walk alone, I'd say, I don't think so. It's, doesn't really come on to our. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, no, it took me. I just don't even. I get in you know, 10 seconds before the yeah. game starts. I never ever sing. Yeah. You'll never walk alone. And I know what you mean about it's that. It's something you'll relate to and stuff, but, but yeah. what I'm saying is that you wouldn't normally get no. a venue full of lads Yeah. Um, singing like That's that. That's insane, and, isn't it? <laughs> and yeah, so that, that was a special moment. How many people does that hold? How many people? Um, about 1800 that night. Um, they restricted the capacity a tiny bit. <laughs> um, I don't forget that was at a time when the whole season had just been geared up for us winning the league and we yeah. didn't even win the league yeah. and it was still one of the best nights ever it was unbelievable yeah, it was night. a good night it, it really really was it was yeah, it was. It, it genuinely was yeah, amazing if you could bottle that and this was at a time as well when we'd done a lot up to this point and we started to get a fair bit of criticism from from people we'd started to take the show on the road, the mm. gig on the road, um, but which you know, I think is something good to ultimately do. It's good first and foremost for for Jamie and the other artists because they're getting paid to go and play 
gigs abroad and stuff now. Mm. Yeah. Wow, how are they going to do it? But I think there's something really good in taking this sort of culture to fans in Ireland or Dubai or America or, or whatever it, it might be. Um, but at this point, May um, 2019, um, final game of the season, we've done a lot of gigs and I think people started to say, that, oh, here they go again. So there's a danger, I think, of this night if we didn't get it right, that people could be like, that's it, it's over, never, ever going again. Mm. But I think the lights I, 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 I remember yeah, just seeing there. a few things on social media and straight away, I think anyone who's there, you know, quickly b- um, battered it away and stuff, as, as Jamie did as well on the podcast. And, yeah. Um, it's hard because we're ordinary lads, you take it to heart. And yeah. it might just be one comment from some anonymous person, it, it sticks with you. And I know, um, you know, I heard Jamie, I heard some of the other lads involved when we were reading some of the. Oh man, was it like the armchair quarterbacks like throwing in their two cents about yeah. like? And, like and, and the other thing as well is like you say, you have got someone who doesn't go to the game and they say, right, oh, boss are charging however much to go to this, and they think, fuck, it. and you think, hang on, you know what? You you don't go to the game, you're not bothered about going the night, so why are you even fucking yeah. commenting? Whereas about all this, it's all been free up to now. So all those nights in district and stuff, all the stuff in the bars, it was all free. Often we got charged. At the end of the night, mm. so even the season's just gone. Um, we played um, Everton and United back to back, free entry and district, absolute chaos. You know, <laughs> people like people on the Instagram are full of balls. It wasn't, you know, it, it's full of three hundred scousers and some, you know, not the nicest of scousers either because like the ball got punched in and stuff, which we got a bill for. Yeah. So I would have rather have been full at this point of people that weren't going to smash the wall, but but you know. No one sees that when they're given, given the criticism. No. To us, as I say, so maybe you know, you put a magnifying glass on it and then you you start to obsess a tiny bit over it. But I think it was very important that we got this night right, and you know, I hope we did. The feedback. Oh, mate, you did. Was it? Was it? Um, did you do the arena after that? Was it after afterwards? Yeah, we did. So so basically, with that, um, so it was called space at the. M&S Bank Arena, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is like the convention centre part. Um, we, somebody planted the seed um, through a business contact in my real job. I was able to, to get in front of the commercial director and, and do a pitch you know, of what what we do, um, which we wouldn't have got through the door otherwise without that. I'd just connection. send them the link of this. I'd just say yeah. to them, just type in yeah. Boss now on YouTube. Yeah. We're fucking so, fine. So, Coming so, to do so, so, so basically, <laughs> we went to them and just said, we've just sold out the Olympia like in like a split second type thing. Um, we're thinking of doing something a bit bigger and the only other big place in the city is, is here. What do you think? <laughs> um, and he, he liked what we what we did. Um, but then what happened was it got very business-like very quickly where... You're getting like serious contracts and then some negotiation over high fees and stuff. This isn't just me turning up saying, I oh, mean, mate Jamie has got a guitar and he's got a little speaker there. And, <laughs> you know, can we have a free type thing? Do you know, you're getting these contracts where tour promoters all around the world get. And there's a reason why every gig at the arena is 40, 50, 60, 70 quid. Or there's a reason why Paul McCartney's charging 150 quid at the arena because mm. it's an expensive place to. To, to do business mm. with so, so we ended up putting together and we, we put it on sale £21 plus their £4 booking fee so 25 quid. Um but as I think Jamie spoke about when he was on that yeah, that yeah. got a bit of criticism but it was so difficult you know to say we've done years and years of free stuff mm. in venues that are now too small Yeah, you've been to it all so you don't need to come to this one but we know there's loads of people that totally, would yeah. quite happily pay 20, 25 quid and by the way we're taking a massive gamble and more mm. to the point, it's like to myself and one or two others that are taking the gamble because the figures involved, you'd be losing your house if it goes wrong. Because mm. they're not going to go, ah, oh, sorry, it didn't work out, boys. Yeah. No, sorry, you had to cancel it at the last minute. They're going to say, we still want that yeah, fee. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we structured it in such a way that it wasn't to make money. It was basically to put put the gig on. Um, I, I think, mate, as well, you know, we mentioned before about well, whether this, whether it's kind of an overnight success people have or it's built up and you're risk averse. I think if you hadn't had the foundations of, you know, little bits, yeah, you, that could have potentially went wrong. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, now as it happened, you know, it was a, it was a decent night. So we didn't 
making absolute fortune off it far, far, far from it, but we didn't lose yeah, yeah. lose mm-hmm. money. It was a great learning curve as well. That um, that ultimately we proved to ourselves that we could pull something off of of that size. Mm. Yeah, I don't think you're risk averse to go. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? But yeah, I mean, but it's like the yeah. build up. Yeah, yeah, it's the build up. It thing, seemed like, like again the next yeah, yeah. natural kind of big thing, which 100%. was hundred yeah. percent. Mate, what happens in Madrid, mate, with the because um, there was a various corporate fan parks on and stuff. You know the one in Madrid. There is, was that a kind of official Liverpool one, official UEFA one, or your one? Or no, that was official Liverpool FC. So Liverpool FC organised the logistics. So the way it works, two teams get to the European Cup final, Champions League final, and UEFA have already got the plans all laid out to say, Team A is going to be here, Team A is going to be here in the ground, their fan park's going to be here and here. Um, the, the transport system is going to bring them in this way and this way. So they've got that all planned out regardless of who's getting mm. to the final. So we get to Madrid um, in the same way we got to Kiev last year and um, the, the, the people at Liverpool will get a, receive notice from UEFA basically this is where you're going to be. Um, now the way it worked in, in Kiev last year um, it was on a much, much, much smaller scale. Um because I don't think anyone at the club really understood what this could mm. could be like. Um, but with Madrid, it was clear, clearly going to be a much much bigger production. So we, we were involved very early on in sort of hitting home to them that it's got to be big. You know, they, they agreed anyway to keep people... Just to stop you there a second, mate, what's it like though, mate, for you personally as a fan, someone who's going, you know, remembers being on the cop for the last day and then suddenly because of this gig, you probably for a European Cup final in Kiev, 12 months later... The club are going right. Listen, mate, we need your advice. We're gonna. What's gonna work? What do you feel um, like on a personal? Forget the business side. As a fan, well, I mean, it's good, but ultimately, the people at the club that we engage with and talk to are exactly the same as us. So it's not as if like you're nervous, thinking, "Oh, what's he gonna think? You know, is he gonna get me? You know, that kind of thing." <laughs> They're just ordinary people. Yeah. So for Madrid, um, I don't know if I should say this too much, but you know, we, I first had a conversation sat in the room with Jamie um, going back way before the semi-final and stuff because naturally really? you've got to think ahead it's the way it's the way it is now you'd be, you be—you wouldn't be doing your job if you didn't if you didn't walk yeah, ahead yeah, yeah. and think if this happens what are we going to do so Jamie and I were in um, in, in Chapel Street and then I um, had a few meetings um, away from there um, where you you have a conversation around what well, if it happens mm. What would Boss provide? How many artists? And what you know, that that kind of thing? Where would it fit in with a wider program? And it isn't just about Boss. It isn't just about Jamie here. Um, there's other people involved, like the Anfield Rap um, did, mm. yeah, they did, 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 yeah. did their stuff. And um, there were other people that were brought in to do things. So it's it's, it's a broad it's a broad church. Ultimately, it's not all about us or mm. anything like that. Mm. But but it's nice to be like involved in the conversations and have have your voice. Listen to and, and be involved. So I, they, I, you, they, just, you seem so. I mean, you are very humble and so <laughs> like, mate. I'd be like, fuck, like, just. I'm sure you are being with pride, <laughs> like, but that's just amazing. Mate. I mean, I was there. I was, you know, probably up thirty meters from the front. I <laughs> mate, genuinely, apart from the, the birth of my daughter, it was that was the best day and night of my life. Yeah. It genuinely was the best day and night of my life. And there's probably thousands and thousands of people that say the same. Yeah. It was absolutely incredible from start to finish. The fan park to obviously the results in the end. Yeah. And the fact, the fact that I kind of know you and Jamie, and it's like it goes to be they, they, your mates doing all this, and it's that special feeling. Are you on the soundboard now? <laughs> no, I am. Yeah, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, 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 well, you can see me on one of the um, one of the thumbnails before at the top. We are to be to the left of here. Um, Well, I'm not doing anything on a day as such, playing a yeah. few tunes, that kind of thing, but the ultimate, it's, it's Jamie that's a superstar here. Yeah. Um, it's the club that have organised the logistics for all this. Um, we're just there to enjoy, enjoy the ride, and, and you know, we certainly did enjoy it. <laughs> just look at that scene, mate. That is one of the best scenes ever. Yeah. That's got to be a pinch yourself moment, that. Uh, yeah, you, have to, you get these all along the way. Um, I think I enjoyed, like, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the Shevchenko Park one a bit more last year. Really? It really felt like um, 
it felt like we'd been building up to that Shevchenko Park moment, like what Jamie did with, with this song, LA, LA, LA. Mm. Um, it wasn't him that wrote this song, but I don't think there's any dispute that it was him that sort of made it um, its own. Um, because we ended up, we released it, didn't we? Yeah. Um, last year, so last May, May 2018. Um, we got it out on he's, the. He jokes saying that uh, Carrie is customer number one or something. Yeah, no, <laughs> see, yeah, yeah. Cause, look, there's me there with John Power. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, um, yeah, we managed to get it out. Um, so, so Jamie had sort of made it his own. Um, he played it's well known story. He played in the halfway else video went viral. We played that he played it at a bus events in district it went super viral then you know we we uploaded it and it got like a million hits within an hour or two you know it just went went, went berserk so he sort of made it, it his own and um phil and william had, that had, had wrote the song um we spoke to in in early may we reached out to him and said um we with jamie um might put this out as as a single um with your permission um and we'd do it and everything would go to charity with it, you know, there'd be none of us would take any money, but we just think it's a good thing to, mm. to get out get out there. Um, but we had a lot of nervousness around the the original tune of the song and who owned the, the melody. So in early May 2018, me and a few of us started emailing like every record company in the world. I felt like trying to work out mm. who owns this original track, and we just got sent on on wild goose chases because the original melody comes from some 80s Euro pop hit, some Italian band. doesn't sound anything like <laughs> what it's turned into, but it can be traced back. So we were desperately trying to find out who owns the rights. And then like, we, got, we had some dead ends where you, you get in touch and say, do you own um, th- this track by this artist? We believe you do. And they'd say, are we own a track of that name by that artist? But it doesn't sound like that. And you're like... Are you sure it might be that we just so, but it, and then in the end we thought it was dead. We thought it, it's not going to happen. This and then a week before the final, um, Jamie rang me up. Someone else had released it and put it on Spotify, and he was gutted because he felt like you know he'd made it into, yeah, yeah. into his song and, and his own. So in an afternoon, this is a Sunday afternoon. The finals, the the Saturday, we managed to arrange to get him into a recording studio the next day. Um, that we got in for free. We got it produced. Free. It was Louis Berry um, that that gave us access to his recording studio, and um, that that John had sorted and um, John Johnson sorted. Um, Jamie gets in there. We managed to get in touch with a distribution company that could help us get it on Spotify, Apple, all that kind of thing. And on the Thursday, it came out. So we got recorded the Monday, mastered the Wednesday, mastered the Tuesday, ready for distribution the the Wednesday, and at midnight, Thursday, one minute past midnight. It appeared on Spotify and iTunes. Um, I, I'm not sure anyone's ever brought anything together that quick. <laughs> but again, it was a real team effort and something that you know Jamie was incredibly passionate and in what he really wanted to do, and we we really wanted to help support him. And as I say, we got the blessing of of the lads um, who who wrote the wrote the lyrics, made sure they were recorded as um, on the credits, that kind of thing, and we we got it out there, and it went top forty. That's crazy. Um, I was in, Didn't it go viral? What in the because Spotify have a thing viral one hundred. That was this it, this um th- this time round um around Madrid, it was like number one in it was like UK, number, yeah. Ireland, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, really, yeah. yeah, Hong Kong, Norway. <laughs> it was like everywhere. But yeah, but we got it out, and um, it's been generating decent royalties, even though Spotify pay a whatever it is, no point, no, 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 not one. Pants for each play. Mm. We've generated thousands for an hour for others. Jesus. Um, that we that keep on means. giving them as, yeah, yeah. as we get the royalties through, straight to them. No yeah, one, yeah. as I say, from yeah. the producer through to the last year, so no one's took a penny. It's been all to, to an hour for others. That's I something that we're, that we're really proud. And I think for me, when we were in Shevchenko Park and Jamie was playing this, having been part of all that and that journey, you know, and the sort of side of the stage watching all this, standing at the side of the stage in Shevchenko Park when he was doing it, that's when I thought, yeah, this was good. <laughs> mate, so special, mate. Where so were special. you, Andy, in all this? Uh, mate, I was life. right in the middle, right in the centre, maybe about 30 metres, no, I'm not even at 20 metres. Where that guy, like... Where probably around, yeah, just behind, maybe around there. Just a little bit more behind. So how many people there, 50,000? 
Well, they they said they were accommodating fifty thousand. That's what they were working to. Um, about an hour before this, the police came over and cut the sound on the sound desk and said there's too many people. So you're talking fifty thousand plus. They're saying every side street is blocked with people as far as it goes Mars, back. Mate, it's fucking there's crazy. too many people. Um, you need to to stop this now. Um, I so remember you was all getting up on stage yeah. and it, before Webster come on and it was yeah. all a bit. So, so I, I was I was gutted for for Jamie at the time, thinking God, you know. Um, you can't pull it now. Luckily for us, there were there were some very senior people there from the club and people who could speak Spanish and stuff that managed to basically say, "If you if you stop this, there's potentially a very bad incident going to yeah. happen." You know, because <laughs> what's everyone going to do? Yeah. Um, so so we ended up um, carrying on with the show, that kind of thing, which is you now another reason why it's good that that we can do this kind of thing with the club. Because imagine mm. if this was us that organised oh, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's me but and that, Sean. I Sean imagine Liverpool police. Football Club can afford much better lawyers than uh... Yeah. <laughs> but that's, mate, that's where the praise has got to come to you, though, mate. That, again, just starting off from what you've done now, a club, with, you know, the magnitude of Liverpool Football Club, are working with you alongside you, trusting you and saying, look, come on, what do you think we should do here? It's, it's unbelievable, mate. So it's all about, you know, with them, like every step of the way, it's, it's trust. Mm. Um because ultimately they are they're my eyes the biggest football club in the world yeah. and, and if you yeah, yeah. if you break the trust they've got a lot more to lose than, of course, yeah. than I have or Jamie has or you know but but it's good that they're opening up and you know the stuff that like the Anfield Rapper now dealing with them and uh, there's others get, that are getting involved um, I, I don't think the club is seeing any of us as, as rivals or a threat or a potential mm. issue it's more how can we all work together and totally, sort of yeah. embrace this this culture around the match Hundred percent. So what's going forward now, mate? When this goes out, we will have just played our first game in the season against Norwich. Um, you got a, a gig on for the Wednesday. This Chelsea, have you? You doing something? No. So Jamie, um, Jamie's doing something at the Super Cup as boss. Where where now? Um, obviously, you no know, boss and Jamie go hand in yeah. hand. But as boss, no, we we don't want to do gigs every single week. Of course, yeah. Um, here, there, and everywhere. Jamie is his own artist. He's gonna make his own money type mm. thing. He's he's gonna take yeah, yeah. Um, opportunities elsewhere. So um, he's doing something for the Super Cup um, over over in Istanbul. So that's like a promoter saying, "Yeah, yeah, let's do something that kind of thing." Mm. If we would have said we're doing something there, we would have all done it together. Um, but but as boss, we took a bit of a back seat this summer, and I was meant to go on the on the club tour with Jamie, um, and we were gonna. Um, we're going to do some big nights over in in the US, but um, for, for sort of personal reasons, there's only so much you can juggle. I I um, decided not to go. Um, so so the nights went builders as boss, and the builders like Jamie Webster, and obviously everyone started a, had an amazing time. Um, as boss, though, we've talked a bit of a, a backseat this summer because I think we were in people's faces so much. Um, we will do stuff, but not not right away. We'll do it when the mm. time's right. Might be we do something at Christmas, or might be we wait till the end of the year in in Liverpool to to do something. Um, the overseas stuff is is good. You no, know, we enjoy it. Mm. If you wouldn't enjoy getting on a plane on Saturday morning to fly to Ireland or Dubai or something and, and do do an event, do a gig, um, and I think we are. I do genuinely believe that we are doing something good when we're playing in Dublin or Belfast to a thousand people, mm. and you know we've we've got this backdrop of. With predominantly Liverpool music, you know, all the bands that we're into, the Bunny Men, Shaq, Castellars, that kind of thing, they're creating a bit of an indie disco and then we're putting our mates on stage, mm. building up to, to Jamie playing. I think it's something really good that people people enjoy. So I think we'll do a couple of them in the meantime, but we'll just play it by ear. Totally. I think as well, mate, Jamie said it great as well. It's, I think as Scousers, you kind of want to bottle things up and it's all like, it's just about us and Scousers. And Jamie said, you know, the people around the world who want to experience what it's like as yeah. well. And you're taking it to them and you're letting them experience it, which is only a good thing, mm. essentially. It's insane watching those YouTube, mate. I've yeah. never been to a boss night, but... yeah. That's oh. what I used to call, I used to go to one and he'd come in on the Monday, we'd see him and he'd go, mate, fucking I need to go to one of these things. <laughs> and I'd go, mate, they're yeah, insane. Good, I mean, also me as well, they're only down to both the artists and the people that, mm -hmm. that, that, that turn up, you know. It, it's not us like sitting in the back, you know, pulling some magic levers or something, yeah. making it work, you know, it's down to, down to these lads. And mate, and fair play to you as well with everything that you've got to juggle. You, you've got to 
have you got children? I've got two kids. Two yeah. kids. <laughs> Fucking full time business. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's insane, mate. Honestly, I don't sleep that much. Believe and, it or and not. I presume you've had a full day at work, and now you, it's te- seven minutes past nine in the evening. Yeah, it's probably yeah. Uh, main. Well, it's probably a good way today. I mean, we've. Is there anything else you want to cover before? No, no, it's, it's good. May I knew I'd, I was fascinated anyway to learn about the 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 things that I didn't know about it and. Um, what I do want to say, mate, again, and I think you should be so proud of those mates, is how inspirational it is for young people in Liverpool as well to see, you know, a young lad, you know, switched on, goes to game, he's one of the boys, and yet he's he's done so much for other people as well and brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. And it's inspirational, mate, to see, you know, you've got a young family, you've got a full-time job, and yet you're doing your little projects, you've not been scared to dream, to push the boat, to do different things, get outside your comfort zone. And I think anyone who's listening to this, you know... It cannot be inspired to think I've got an extra couple of hours a week there I should yeah. maybe try and pursue this other project or try and do this and you know if anyone doesn't listen to this and think that you know they've got excuses why they can't do it then you know they need to listen to it again because I, th- I think it's amazing what you've done mate so yeah, nice one appreciate it um, if there's one thing that could come out of all all this and everything we've we've done I'd love to turn up at the match this season and see a young lad standing there <laughs> with a black and white fanzine <laughs> for a pound called whatever they're going to call it and um and then you know let them tell the story because we can't tell the story anymore because we're not going to every every single away game you know we're not going to every European away we're not at a gig every week but there's people that are and there's very very important stories that aren't being told at the minute or they're getting lost on on social media or the forums and I just really hope that one day one one of the young lads or girls at the match will have the um have I, I have the drive to sort of do this you know, they really should. Well, that's the challenge to all the young Reds listening. Danny's put it out there for you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening, subscribing, passing the pods, telling everyone about it. Yeah, mate, if that, yeah, we really summarised it well then at the end. Yeah, it's quality that. I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be there whenever you're next. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you so much, mate. Do, do you want to let? Right. Where, where is there any um, any links you want to say before? Nothing. Honestly, it's alright. You sure? Yeah, because because if I say any links, someone's gonna go. Oh, he's just selling us. Yeah. <laughs> right, just before we go then, um, obviously this podcast is sponsored by Liverpool One. So uh, Liverpool One have got three sort of areas that we, they want to push um, this coming summer. The first is a competition where they're giving 20 grand um, away. So the chance for basically it's 20 children's sports teams or clubs to each win a thousand pounds to help with running costs, equipment or kit. Um, they've got a daily programme of free family fun on Chavez. Chavas. 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 <laughs> Shavas Park um, so go to www.liverpool-one.com and um, obviously sports events on the park we mentioned with Tickle the Ivories Piano Festival and a slide from the first floor of South John Street down to the ground floor and of course yourself Andy this Friday I'm going to be there Friday the 16th come and say hello come and buy me book <laughs> <laughs> come and uh, have me a race yeah, come and support Liverpool One, the Summer of the Champions. It's been great so far. And yeah, come and if you haven't heard my story, come and listen to it, get a ticket. Uh, you need to get the tickets from the website. So head over there, get the tickets, come and hear me speak. And yeah, look forward to seeing you all then. Cheers. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. <laughs>